Welcome back everyone. This lecture is going to be about confidence intervals. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the importance of confidence intervals, how to calculate confidence intervals, as well as discussing the factors that affect the width of confidence intervals. The reading that goes along with this uh, particular lecture is chapter 5, module 9 of your course textbook. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of confidence intervals. We went through a hypothesis test using a, a Z test for one sample mean. And in that test, we rejected the null hypothesis and concluded that the average weight of, ma of male inmates has changed and is no longer 200 pounds. So at the conclusion of that test, we know that it's no longer 200 pounds. But if our sample didn't come from a population with a mean of 200, well, what type of population did it come from? This is what confidence intervals are going to be able to help us out with. In other words, what is the new population mean? Next slide. All right, a little more information about the importance of confidence intervals. I asked the question, what does the new population mean? Well, what are we, what am I getting at with that? A confidence interval will help us to answer that question. Well, sort of, because remember, we are working with sample data and in the realm of working with sample data and inferential statistics, we're not going to get an exact answer. We're not going to get a 100% certainty answer, but we can compute an estimate of what the new population mean might be. If it's no longer 200, what is it? The estimate that we're going to compute is known as a confidence interval. And a confidence interval as defined is a range of values that will include the unknown population parameter with a known degree of certainty. So for us, let's break that down. The first thing is we're looking at a range of values. That's what a confidence interval is. It's an interval. It's not gonna give us a specific answer about what the new population mean is. Instead, it's gonna give us a range, a, high, a low value and a high value. And somewhere, we hope that, that that will include this unknown population parameter, in our example, trying to predict what is the new population mean with a known degree of certainty. Well, what do we mean by a known degree of certainty? That is what is called the level of confidence. And the technical definition of the level of confidence is the percent of time that a series of confidence intervals will include the unknown population parameter. So not to go too much into statistical jargon, but it's if you were to compute 100 confidence intervals of samples of the same size from the same population, yada, 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 how many of them will actually include the unknown population parameter? Those are the technical definitions, but for us, if you look towards the bottom of the slide, in other words, and this is a better way to understand it, how confident are we that this range of values actually includes the new population mean? So this range of values to try to estimate some unknown population value, are we gonna be 90% confident? Are we going to be 95% confident, 99% confident, or some other value? We can never be 100% confident. All right, let's move on to the next slide. How do we calculate confidence intervals? Well, we first need to think about when calculating a confidence interval, how confident do we want to be? Do, as we saw in the last slide, do we want to be 90, 95, 99% confident that the range of values will in fact include our unknown population parameter? And to remind you once one more time, we can never be 100% confident because we are working with sample data. So typically, researchers, as we will do in, throughout this class, we typically begin with a 95% confidence interval. This value corresponds perfectly with an alpha of 0.05. So you may recall we set alpha at 0.05 in our initial hypothesis test. Now that 0.05 ties back into a 95% confidence interval. So how do we interpret in loose terms a 95% confidence interval? Well, if we look at the very bottom bullet point on the slide, 
we are 95% certain that the true population mean falls within the range created by the interval. So keep that in mind. That's kind of our goal right now is how do I take, what's the takeaway for, from a confidence interval? All right, let's move on to the next slide. Let's talk about how we calculate confidence intervals. So as we look at this slide, we move from the top toward the bottom. And what I've done, and this is the same way I would do if I was teaching this on the whiteboard in class. I start with a very generic formula, a formula that you could use if somebody were ever to ask you to compute a confidence interval for anything outside of this class or within this class. A confidence interval starts and is centered around a sample estimate. So in our case, our sample estimate is the sample mean. We had a mean for the average weight of male inmates of 210 pounds. So that's what we're starting with. In order to figure out what's going on in the population or what kind of population that sample mean came from, we then need to add on the rest of the equation. So if you look at the generic formula, the very first line, we start with a sample estimate. Then we do plus minus what is known as, and what you'll see in parentheses, is going to be called the margin of error. And I'll come back to that in a couple slides. That margin of error includes two critical components. It includes the critical value for whatever test statistic we're working with, as well as the standard error for that particular test. Now let's start to personalize a little bit. Let's move down to the second line. The second line is the fact that we are working with a Z test, so we're going to do the Z formula for the sample mean. So we start our sample estimate now becomes the sample mean. So you'll see at the bottom of the page when we get there, we will start with that value of 210. Then it's plus or minus the critical value. Well, we're working with a Z formula, so it's going to be the Z critical value. And we're going to multiply it by the standard error of the mean because we our sample estimate was, in fact, a mean. Let's move down to the third line. Now that we've decided we're going to be computing a 95% confidence interval using that Z formula, we can personalize it a little bit more. So we're going to start with our sample mean plus or minus the Z, the Z critical is plus or minus 1.96. So we just put the absolute value of 1.96. So our Z critical is 1.96 times the standard error of the mean. And what you see there um, is the formula for the standard error of the mean where it is the population value of the standard deviation, which was sigma, divided by the square root of the sample size n. All right, so now at the very bottom of this slide, let's take a look at our example. We started with a sample mean of 210. We were given information about a population standard deviation of 40, and we had a sample size of 100. So we need all those pieces of information in order to compute our confidence interval. So as we look down to the bold numbers at the bottom of the slide, we see that we insert a sample mean of 210, plus or minus, and within those parentheses, we have the Z critical of 1.96 times the population standard deviation of 40 divided by the square root of the sample size of 100. And as we solve out that, that equation, we eventually get down to what we see at the very bottom, which says 210 plus or minus 7.84. So let's see how we turn this into our final confidence interval. Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so as we see at the top of the page here, we have the 95% confidence interval for our example equals 210 plus or minus 7.84. That plus or minus 7.84 is a term that is referred to in statistics as the margin of error. Why do we have a margin of error? Well, thinking back to one of the first slides for this uh, lecture, we said that we can never make a perfect conclusion about what the unknown population value is. We don't know exactly what the population mean is, but we can come up with a range of values, a confidence interval. So that margin of error is going to help us create that range of values around our sample estimate of 210. So let's move on to the second bullet point there where it says to obtain. So to obtain the lower and upper bounds of the confidence interval, we need to solve out the equation, that 210 plus or minus 
And so a couple of the terms you're going to start to see here is one, now we're going to create the range of values by solving out this equation. And also it gives us two important things. The lower value is known as the lower bound of a confidence interval. The upper value is known as an upper bound. And these are just terms that are typically used. So to compute the lower bound, we take 210 minus the margin of error of 7.84, and we get 202.16. To compute the upper bound, we just take 210, our sample estimate, plus the margin of error of 7.84, and we get 217.84. With that, our final range of values for the 95% confidence interval looks like what you see at the very bottom of the slide. Our estimate, if somebody were to say, well, you collected data from a sample of 100 inmates and weighed all of them, and you wanna know what the average weight of male inmates is now, your sample said, 210 was the average weight. Well, what's, what kind of population did that sample come from? The range of values at the bottom of this slide is our best, effort, best estimate with 95% confidence. So we would say, well, with 95% confidence, we think that the average weight of male inmates is somewhere between 202.16 pounds and 217.84 pounds. So once again, our best estimate of what the true average weight of male inmates is in the population is somewhere between 202.16 pounds and 217.84 pounds. And that's what we see displayed at the bottom of this slide. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, so we saw the final range of values and I've interpreted already of 202 to 217.84. So we can conclude with 95% confidence that the unknown population mean falls between a value of 202.16 pounds and 217.84 pounds. All right, so what, what's the takeaway from that? Well, the first takeaway is that gives us our best estimate. If somebody were to ask, well, okay, so the weight of male inmates has changed. Well, how much has it changed? It's no longer 200 going back to our previous lecture. So what is it now? Well, it's somewhere between roughly 202 and 218 pounds. Okay, so that's our best estimate. And then note from the previous presentation where we talked about our actual hypothesis test, the null value, the old population value had a mean of 200. When you look at our 95% confidence interval, you'll note that that value does not fall between 202.16 and 217.84. That is a good indicator of why, in our previous hypothesis test, why we rejected that null hypothesis. Our data at a 95% level of confidence, which co corresponds to an alpha of 0.05, says that our sample seems to have come from a population somewhere between roughly 202 and 218 pounds, not from a population that was centered around a mean of 200. So that's a key thing to take away when thinking about confidence intervals. We can use confidence intervals similar to trying to make the final conclusion of a hypothesis test if we know what our confidence interval is and if we know what the null hypothesis was from the original test. If the null hypothesis falls within the confidence interval, we can't reject it as a possibility. If the null hypothesis lies outside of the confidence interval, then we do reject it, just as we did with this particular example. All right, let's move on to the next slide. All right. There's a couple factors that can affect how wide a confidence interval is. So you may recall in our previous one, it was roughly 202 to 218, right? Um, so it was about 16 pounds wide or 16 points wide. So, but how might, depending upon a different sample or different information that we may change, what can affect how wide that interval is? So let's take a look at that formula once again. So you'll notice here on this side, the blue uh, for the confidence interval, it says sample mean plus or minus our margin of error. And our margin of error is the critical value of Z, 1.96, times the standard error of the mean the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So when looking at that, we have to think, okay, the sample mean is, is 
are given. It's a fixed point. So what within the margin of error can influence how wide our overall interval or range ends up being? So if you look at it, there are two primary things that can impact the width of the interval. These are the two pieces in the margin of error component of the formula. The first is the level of confidence, right? A level of confidence of 95%, which is typically what we start with, corresponds to an alpha of 0.05. And when we're working with a Z test, an alpha of 0.05 using a two-tailed test ends up with a critical value of 1.96. But you can imagine another researcher or in another example, if we had changed the level of confidence, if we want to be a little bit less confident or a little bit more confident, say 90% confident or 99% confidence, that will actually change the actual Z critical value. The second thing that can influence the width of the interval is the sample size. The sample size you'll see is the denominator of the standard error of the mean. So if we change the sample size that we are working with, that can also have an influence on how wide our interval will be. So let's take a closer look at those two things. Next slide. All right. Let's first take a look at the level of confidence. We start with a 95% level of confidence. We had a critical value of 1.96. But if we change the level of confidence to say 90% or 99%, that changes the critical value. And think back to that area under the curve chart that we worked with in class and we've talked about previously. We figured out a Z critical of 1.96 because we wanted to know the the value of Z, where if we split the two tails, where a total air area under the, um, the uh, standard normal distribution would be a total of 5%. And we found that, that Z value corresponded to 1.96. Well, if we change our level of confidence one way or another, then it's no longer a critical value of 1.96, it changes. So for example, the first blue bullet point we see here as the level of confidence changes from say 95 to 99, so you wanna be even more confident that you've captured the unknown population value, that changes the Z critical value. And in fact, it would change it from 1.96 to 2.58, because we no longer want 5% of the total area under the curve in the rare areas. If we change to a 99% confidence, we only want 1% of the quote unquote rare area under the curve and that's what changes the Z critical to a 2.58. So what happens when we do that? Well, what happens is the 99% confidence interval will end up being wider than the 95% confidence interval. And if you go back and look at our previous example and, and do the calculations, you'll see exactly how it will widen it. Why? Because one piece of the margin of error is the Z critical value. Well, if we increase the Z critical value, then the overall answer you get for that margin of error is gonna be a larger value. And that's where we see that come into play. Moving on to the second factor that can affect the width of the confidence interval, we see the sample size. The sample size, as mentioned on the previous slide, is the denominator of the standard error of the mean. So therefore, by changing the sample size, it also impacts the standard error of the mean. The standard error of the mean is part of the margin of error, so therefore changing the sample size influences the margin of error. How does this do this? Well, remember, the sample size is in the denominator, the bottom portion of the standard error of the mean. So a larger sample size will increase that denominator of the standard error of the mean. Therefore, anytime you have a fraction where the denominator gets larger, the overall value of the answer, the standard error of the mean in that particular case, gets smaller. So a larger sample size will increase the denominator of the standard error of the mean, thus decreasing the overall value of the standard error of the mean. If we decrease the overall value of the standard error of the mean, that is going to narrow or reduce your margin of error. You reduce your margin of error once you solve everything out, that means that by increasing the sample size, that will result in a narrower confidence interval and vice versa. Next slide.